Carbon dioxide plus water. I'm going to put the letter CA. And I'm going to put hydrogen plus the carbonate. And we're going to spend time, basically that's going to involve pH. It's sort of, you know, it's going to involve acidosis, alkalosis. That's a major thing in this chapter, and that's going to be very important. And so that's going to be most of it. There's going to be just a couple slides on Chapter 6 uh, near the end, which I'm going to show, which are just reviewing positive negative feedback. Okay? All the other ones, and if, if you look at your study questions or the extra questions, uh, they're involved on cell signaling in Chapter 6, or other types of transport in Chapter 5, besides osmosis and tonicity, uh, simply are not going to be covered in this test, and we'll see what I do with them later. Okay. Any questions about what's going to be on the test, at least at this point? Okay. Let's, let's look at this. You, you're going to see as I go through this that I'm going to relate a lot of this sort of overall metabolism, okay, and energy to our famous blood glucose homeostasis because, again, blood glucose is extremely important and we're going to see our whole, even now, our whole metabolism has to do with controlling glucose levels. Not just glucose, but fats and proteins as well. And we're going to have these hormones uh, which we'll review again, they're going to help do this. And so all we're doing, again, is adding another layer to this. The other thing I want to make sure I, that I talk about, which I may or may not have mentioned, but I'm mentioning it now, is, you know, we know what we have, and we'll get back to that a little bit, you know, a little bit later. We know we have to, uh, diabetes when you have high blood sugar, you know, that's chronic. There's actually two types, and I want to make sure that we sort of, uh, if I didn't do it before, that I distinguish a couple basic ideas of what the two types are. Okay? So again, you know, you can start to have this down as we go, or write it as you go, but we are ready to go. And I've already lost this. Okay. So, so energy and metabolism, they, they're going to go together. Uh, you know, again, you'll see what you don't have to know overall. I, I put this up to basically when you're distinguishing life, there's always you know, a number of things that, you, that are listed on it. But all of them involve something like, number two, that to be alive, you've got to somehow acquire and use energy. That's the basic property. Now, I'm not going to be on this test. Again, this is review of general bio as far as these terms. But when it comes down to it, a couple of just factoids about energy, and then we'll get to us, uh, that, you know, of all the life on Earth, there are autotrophs and heterotrophs. So the autotrophs are actually able to take the energy from the sun and transform them into chemical energy, uh, which is basically food that we're going to eat. And so they're able to do it directly. We are heterotrophs. We cannot use that energy directly from the sun, although it feels good or maybe too hot, whatever. But by eating the food, we're going to break down the food, and, and within those chemical bonds, we're going to release energy. And the key will be, and we'll get to this, is as we're sort of eating and breaking down food, releasing energy from those bonds, we need it to basically make our universal energy source, ATP. And then when we talk about all the things we're going to be doing in our body, transport, making things, we'll use ATP as sort of that universal currency. So overall, I mean, just putting this up, we've got the plants capturing that energy from the sun, putting it into, you know, chemical bonds of food, and, you know, we might have some animals, you know, some consumers in the middle, but overall, we're going to eat these foods, uh, and we're going to allow them to get in our system, and then, basically, as we break those foods down, we're going to use it to make ATP, and then whenever we need to do something, ATP will go back down to ADP, and, again, we're going to use this energy to do cellular work, which is everything. And, you know, we're going to do the details of this. Again, right now, the first couple of minutes, you know, know when to sort of drop back and see the overall. And I'll make sure, you know, the details that we need to know are coming. But we're not going to have our autotrophs. Now, I've already talked about this, and this should be sort of clear to us now, that, uh, you know, the, the two different types of energy. 
kinetic in motion. We have this poor little student for extra credit roll up this ball on a hill. And that's energy because it's potential energy. It's energy that if we allow, again, I usually use the example of water in a dam, if we uh, allow to use that energy, it can be used to make electricity or, or to move. Again, for us, you know, you want to be thinking right now, if you look at whatever structure we're looking at, hydrocarbon, or it could be part of glucose, that there is potential energy within these bonds. That is the key. It's not just, you know, you know, it's you know, covalent bonds and all that we have to know, but it's potential energy. And so it's the idea of breaking these down that's going to release that energy. R, the other thing I had mentioned before is that if we make some sort of chemical gradient, and so we pump, let's say, a lot of sodium out or whatever, you know, oxygen on one side, whatever we have, if we have a lot on one side versus another, Okay, that's potential energy, that if we sort of allow sodium to cross or anything else, then it's going to use that energy to, we'll see, you know, basically do different things. So, you know, potential energy within bonds, potential energy within concentration gradients. So concentration gradients, which we will go through throughout the course, is another form of potential energy. Now, I'm not, again, we're about to get to something which will be a little harder. We're going to take some more time and fit it in on the board. But, but it's important to look at this that when, you know, we have to obey the laws of, of chemistry and physics. Okay? You know, we're here. We sort of, you'll see as we go through the course, our physiology sort of exploits that to our advantage, but you've got to obey it. And overall, here are the laws of thermodynamics. Again, not a test question. But the first law is that you're not going to destroy or create energy. You're transforming it from one form to the other. And we've already started to see that. And then the other aspect is as you do each of these steps, including every sort of chemical reaction in the body that, that we talk about or even that we haven't talked about, uh, you're losing a little bit of energy. Okay? There's less usable energy. And you know, usually this is, in, in the, uh, this is basically heat. Uh, so is that bad? I like to keep my body temperature at 98.6. How we keep, you know, basically, if, if you're, you know, homeothermic here, how we keep body temperature is actually exploiting that, okay? Actually saying, okay, well, we're going to lose energy, but that energy is in the form of heat. That will heat us up, okay? I won't put this one up again. You're going to review uh, thermoregulation from the first day, and you remember when, when uh, you're too cold, you're, you're hypothermic, you want to generate heat, you're going to shiver. shiver. Okay, we're going to see, well, we're not going to see, but basically that, in that way, if we're exploiting the second law, that's going to create heat, to, to, you know, to heat us up. So, laws are important, and we're going to obey them. Okay, here we go. Terms, and we're going to apply it here. So, exergonic and endergonic, and then we're going to fit it into the system. Again, exergonic, you basically are releasing energy, and, you know, we're going to put an example up here as well, but when you break things down, that's usually releasing energy. And so overall, the idea of breakdown here is going to be exergonic reactions. Energy is released. Okay, this is sort of the global idea. Exergonic. Okay, this is breakdown. That's why I put the arrow down. I want to put another term up here with exergonic, and that is when we're breaking things down in our body, you know, more than that, but when we're talking about converting proteins to amino acids, our lipids here to the fatty acids, they are catabolic reactions. So all the ones we have here, which are the major ones, and we've seen this before uh, for when we introduced the, the major groups here in chapter 2, uh, the, all the ones going down are catabolic reactions, and they are releasing energy, which makes them exergonic. If we're making things, I think we need energy. So when you're making things, they require energy, and so you're putting energy in, and they are endergonic reactions. And the other term associated with that for metabolism is when we make things, you know, those type of reactions, they are called anabolic. And 
right here globally, and then we're going to actually name, and you're going to see it's not going to be that as hard, we're going to name all the processes specifically here, but globally we're linking energy and metabolism, the name of this chapter. Okay? Metabolism is going to be making and breaking things down, and it's involving energy, and we're going to see how these link together. That means when we put amino acids together to make proteins, or put glycerol and three fatty acids together to, you know, to make up. So that's all endergonic. All those are endergonic, and they are called an anabolic, exactly. When we're breaking proteins back down, those are going to be exergonic, releasing energy, and catabolic. Okay? So overall, and uh, the spe specific ones that we're going to do. Now, take a second. Look at that, and then forget all of this. Because just, we're not, I'm going to read the bullet points here, but this is very, very important. But I'm going to make it make sense, uh, attempt to, putting it purely in biological terms, like us, right? Instead of some chemical reaction, A plus B, a coupled reaction. The two things that say, we're going to link an exergonic and ergonic collection together. Okay, well, that seems okay. But how are we going to do it, and what it means is the second statement there which right now is just words. That energy being released from exergonic is going to power the endergonic. Okay? Let's apply that. Let's go over here to our famous glucose, glycogen, uh, you know, basically going down for this here. Again, glucose being central. Now, again, even from these arrows right now, you notice as I break down glucose to pyruvate and then go through all those steps of respiration that maybe you, you remember or memorized, maybe you didn't, you don't have to know, but we're breaking this down. You notice we're not taking CO2, I don't have arrows going up to glucose uh, because uh, I'm not a plant, okay, we're not plants. That's what photosynthesizers do. So here, we're going to go glucose to glycogen back and forth, okay, you know, storing it and releasing it, and that's sort of, you know, and then we can break it down. <laughs> okay, so... Just to sort of get this, when you break down glycogen to glucose, is that going to be an exergonic or an endergonic reaction? Re uh, reaction. So, exergonic. How about when you continue to break glucose down to pyruvate? And let's go ahead and break it all the way down to CO2 that we're going to breathe out. Exergonic. Okay, breakdown. All this breakdown, we're doing it, and you see the whole process to extract that energy, and those are exergonic reactions. Okay? Same thing on these, but I'm not gonna, you know, not gonna do them. Okay? So the breakdown is all of that. Let's just go over here when we're just for this one right here. When we're taking glucose and putting it together for glycogen for a rainy day, this reaction is what? Endergon. And it will apply to all those, but that's the one we're using. Let's do one more, okay? And not even look at that right now. We have this reaction. We're going to see overall ATP is our universal energy source. We're not going to make it from scratch each time. We're going to sort of cycle between this diphosphate and this triphosphate, with the triphosphate ATP having more energy. So, again, we sort of have, I have the same idea here, uh, idea here of when we're going from ADP to ATP, what is that reaction? Is it endergonic or exergonic? Requires is energy. Okay, and I'm just going to put END. When we're breaking down ATP to ADP, that is a exergonic. So, before I move on, is that sort of making sense now? All right. Now, here's the beauty of this, at least in my mind. We'll go right here. Okay, ADP to ATP requires energy. It's an endergonic reaction. Where are we going to get that energy? Where are we getting it? I mean, overall, where are we getting it? From the exergonic reactions. <laughs> We're going to break down glucose, okay, all the way, and those are exergonic reactions. That, ex that energy is going to drive the production of ATP. That is what a coupled reaction is. You can read that sentence, but that's what we're basically showing here. 
that sort of this idea here. We're coupling these two types of reactions. We're breaking down the food, which has the energy of the chemical bonds. We're releasing that. Those are exergonic reactions. We're using that to drive the production of ATP, which is an endergonic reaction. That's why when you look, when you look at the, the, just the sentence here, that's what it's saying. We're linking the two. We're linking exergonic and endergonic. And you've got to get the relationship. And I think it's sort of common sense when you do it. The idea is... The exergonic reactions of breaking down this food, extracting that energy, is used to drive the endergonic, to produce ATP. That's why we eat. We're going to eat, we're going to break down all, you know, all these foods, including fats, release energy, and capture it to make ATP. A coupled reaction. That's how I want you to remember coupled reaction. I don't want you to remember you know, this type of thing because we're not doing that type of class right now. We're not doing to that level and it just is AB. You know, that kind of thing. This is metabolism. This is sort of the overall idea. So the exergonic from the glycogen cycle? From the breakdown of it. From the breakdown of it, it's, it's what drives the endergonic? Yes. The ATP. Right. Okay. And that's what a coupled reaction is, it's, you know, especially for our terms. How about over here? Okay. Glucose, we're going to put glucose together to make glycogen. And we already said that's an endergonic reaction, right? It needs energy. Where are we getting that energy from? What energy is going to be used to make this? What energy do we use? What is our universal energy? ATP. So if we, and we can even put that up here, we already had this, so we had it. We have the idea that when we break ATP back down to ADP, that's going to be exergonic. What is that going to do? Drive the endergonic. Okay? So it's, it's, this is the overall sort of metabolism is basically that we're going to eat food, we're going to break it down, extract all that energy to make our one thing, ATP. And then, and that's a coupled reaction, the breakdown of all this food releases energy to drive the production of ATP. But then, this is the idea of cellular work, then when we break, a, when we want to use it, ATP is broken back down to ATP, ADP. That releases ex energy, exergonic, that drives making everything, or also transporting things, anything we want. But that's the idea of a coupled reaction. And so if you look at overall metabolism, without even the details, you see it's sort of you know, where that the catabolic reactions, exergonic, drive all of our anabolic reactions. And so overall metabolism being sort of you know, a number of these coupled reactions. You know, and that's why I do it this way versus just this or what's in the book and you don't have it in your handout because, you know, you teach it a couple of times, you're like, maybe this is better and it starts to make more sense. And it relates to something that, you know, it's not some abstract term, okay, coupled reactions, okay. It actually is energy metabolism. It's actually how we work, okay. Relatively complicated, but hopefully, first of all, I hope you have that down. But, uh, but that's sort of what I wanted to get out of that section, yeah. And you're saying they're vice versa, because you said cat catabolic reactions drive the anabolic? The catabolic reactions drive the uh, anabolic reactions, right? It's not, yeah. It's not the other way around. It's not a cycle, though? It's, it, uh, well, it will be, because then we'll go ahead and break it down. Yeah. Right, but that's not, that won't be the definition of, the coupled of that kind of coupled reaction. The coupled reaction idea is sort of the making is how are we going to make things? So exergonic drives endergonic. Okay. Okay. That's the first major concept. We're going to come back and and name some of these things in a minute. You don't need to know more about ATP. I mean, you know, overall. If, you know, overall, the idea of this, though, is why ATP triphosphates is so powerful that these phosphate groups are negatively charged and they're right next to each other and negative sort of repels negative. If you put a third one there, it's like putting a, you know, a jack-in-the-box, kind of crossing it down. And does anybody know a jack-in-the-box? I don't know. I'm pretty old. But, uh, <laughs> there you go. A couple people. But you know, that's potential energy in the spring, and then you can release it. So you see all these negative charges sort of all pushed together. But you don't need to know structure. You just need to know what we said.
Okay, a couple things about enzymes, and then we do these two major things. And then that's chapter four. Uh, and then we're going to, I have just a couple, you know, we're going to relate it to, to blood glucose. A couple other things. And again, to, to remind people uh, as well, there is no lab. Uh, and uh, basically, I'm here as long as anybody needs it. Just if you have to go, you want to go, you will. But I'll be here to review uh, those extra questions uh, that, that hopefully you printed out. Again, the last few are going to involve things which we don't cover. But the other ones, again, involve some critical thinking and some of those questions which have some you know, complicated you know, multiple choice that I want you to sort of work through with me that you can actually get it. Sorry. Don't There's sorry. no lab today? No. Oh. So it's just going to be, uh, yeah, I'm just going to stay here and review for, for people. Because at Monday's lab, there was no lab, obviously, so yeah. that. I mean, it says pH take home. And, you know, next week after the test, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, 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 I'll, sh I'll get, update the whole lab schedule, and we'll make sure we, we, cover, we cover it. Overall, too, just to let you know, on Monday, <laughs> there is no lab either, no matter what it says. On test days, I basically, I might have an exception, uh, but I basically try not to have lab because I want to give people maximal time and really we just have, you know, probably basically at 8 o'clock if you want to just work on the test because you want to take time on the test. Carefully go through the questions because right or wrong might depend upon one word. Okay, you know, increase or decrease, and you know, so you want to make sure that you're not going to make that mistake, and you'll, you know, highlight it or underline it. Be very careful and write over the test. Okay, that will actually help. So, uh, won't have lab, and then um, I'll tell Wednesday. I'll set up like we probably will have. We'll just have a Wednesday, and then Monday we'll have the same lab. So we'll be kind of off. Your question. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the test, sorry. Uh, do we bring on Scantron? Bring Scantron, please. Try to remember. Uh, are, are those poor souls who have to like borrow scantrons, you know, that's the way it goes. Those are these green scantrons, does everybody kind of know them? There's 50 questions, you know, 50 on each side. Green scantron, you need, for that one problem, you have one, you know, uh, molar conversion problem with several steps, like the glucose one we did in that lab. Uh, you need a calculator, you can't use a phone, you can't use, a, you can't have a graphing calculator because you can write notes, etc., like that. So you have to have just a basic calculator. All you're going to have to do is, you know, divide, multiply, you know, that type of thing. But you do need that if you're going to, you know, take that, that question. Okay? Another, do we have another question? That was my question. Was if it was all multiple choice or if there were extra, like, conversion problems? There, there, and the, the conversion problem, by the way, is a multiple choice problem. Okay? So I don't have it. So there's about 40, 41. That's usually what it is. Uh, multiple choice worth two points. And then there's 18 to 20 points of free response type um, answers. So the scan is the long green one? Long green one. Okay. You'll be able to write the other stuff directly on the test. You don't need any kind of blue book. We're going to do that. Okay. I'll answer that question because, and in fact, as soon as I do enzymes, a couple slides, we're going to name all these basically, and uh, that, no, I'll tell you the answer. So uh, just a couple things about enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. Okay, that's sort of important. Enzymes are going to be proteins, that class, okay, and remember things about proteins. Uh, and, you know, right now we have this idea that do we have sort of a picture. Again, we're not going to have to, we're going to talk about activation energy. That overall the idea is, and you can just sort of look at me because it's not going to be as, as bad as you think. An enzyme is a protein. Proteins work by, by what? Their shape. Okay? Their tertiary structure. You're going to review primary, secondary, tertiary structure. And what they're basically going to do is, you know, and again, I can sort of have it up here. Let's say you were going to have the reaction A plus B equals C. So that one we will be sort of, you know, abstract here. And even if that was going to release energy, I guess not really equal C. I'm sort of in my math now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but we convert it to one, like combine it together. So A and B equal, combine it to be C. Even if that was going to release energy, uh, we're going to see that it's not going to just happen automatically. But A's and B's might be some gases or something in together. What an enzyme does is, okay, by their shape, basically has sort of a pocket here for these two that will put them together. It will change shape, 
once, once these, what we call substrates bind, and that will allow us more efficiently to make C, and then it goes back to its original shape, okay, and we're going to talk about the activation energy, it goes back to its original shape and does it again, because we don't want to make an enzyme and just have it do it once. So these are proteins that just speed up reactions, you know, a thousand fold, okay? So that's the basic idea of an enzyme, again, okay? and you can kind of read it here. But we do need, and I put this, you know, in bold here, we need to understand the concept of activation energy because it lowers the activation energy, and what that means, as kind of showed again by this guy trying to get extra credit, is that even reactions, which are extragonic, boom, release a lot of energy, they don't spontaneously happen. That's good, because we don't want reactions in our body just automatically happening that are releasing energy. We want to control them. So it takes a given amount of energy for all reactions to go, and that's called the activation energy. Okay? You've got to put energy in to have the reaction go. Whether it releases energy or not later, it doesn't matter. That's the key. And again, that's going to provide us control so that when we want it to happen, we're going to activate an enzyme, and the enzyme lowers that activation energy. So by doing that, now this is going to speed up the reaction a thousandfold. When we want to start you know, converting glucose and go through that whole cycle there, uh, and with each one has a different enzyme, we'll get those enzymes going and we'll start. But we might want to stop, okay, because we want to do that. We might want to slow it down, and so we'll basically deactivate the enzymes. It will be sort of a negative feedback type thing. So the idea is that's what the, en the enzymes are going to do. When we need them, for a reaction, they're going to lower that activation energy, and that will speed things up a thousandfold. And that's basically what an enzyme does. Remember, it's a protein. Okay, one more thing about enzymes, or maybe just two little things, but this one's important. And I'm going to use this space here. Again, and what that with enzymes is general bio, but this. Uh, I like proenzymes or zymogens. Okay, but, you know, overall, what the slide is saying, enzymes are proteins, but there's a couple of variations that will help them. Ions, like magnesium and calcium, basically are necessary for function. So all ions, remember, are going to do a lot during this course. They're helping enzymes work. Also, some vitamins will as well, and you know. Coenzyme A, stuff like that. So vitamins can also help. But that's the guy I want. Okay? Proenzymes are zymogens. What they are are the following. We're going to make a protein in which part of it basically makes this so it's not working, it's inactive. And so we're making sort of a protein with two parts, and we have this inactive one which is called a proenzyme or a zymogen. Would you take one with the other on the test with your name? If it's filling, but you have to recognize them both as a multiple choice question, I could use either of them. What's going to happen then is we're going to make these things inactive. Okay, as a proenzyme or a zymogen, again, just the same, the same idea. And when we want to activate it, we're going to cut it with an enzyme called a protease, because this is a protein. And now this guy is active. So we're making it as, a, as a, an inactive zymogen. And when we want it to be active, we'll use an enzyme to cut that piece off, and now it's active. Okay? That's going from inactive to active. Now, you might ask, why do that? So let's just say a former student that's still right after me comes in and comes in and stabs me. Okay? And I'm like, over here. Okay? I sort of want, well, I need some help probably, but I sort of want my blood to clot. So do I want to say liver? Make some clotting enzymes and please deliver it to my, to my point of impact. Or do we want this proteins of clotting proteins to be there, ready to go, and then, boom, activate. 
And so you never have to memorize this cascade, which is good. This is a Zymogen cascade. This is blood clotting. And the idea of this is, without looking, but if you can actually see it's complicated, are that the liver are going to make all of these guys, which are clotting factors, and they're circulating in our blood, but they're circulating as inactive zymogens because we don't want our blood just to clot. But we want them there in case something happens. So that's why you can see I'm sort of, when I jump up and down, I'm sort of excited about zymogens. So, because it makes some sense for me. So the idea is all these factors are there, and then some sort of damage, again, it's complicated, as you can see, but some sort of damage will initiate that, and then these zymogens will be converted to active ones. And really what happens is that, and again, you don't, you know, you're not going to have to do this cascade. We'll see this again when we do blood clotting a bit. But overall, we find that then one of these now is like a protease which activates the next zymogen, and then that activates the next, and it's again, it's sort of like this little explosion. It's actually a positive feedback loop. Because again, we don't want this homeostatic, let's clot a little bit, okay, that's okay. We want it to clot to form. And so all these things basically just, you know, it's like, you know, lighting the fuse and they just, they go all the way. So if, a, if, a, if someone stabs you, would that activate the blood clotting thing? Yes. Oh. Or, you know, it might just be cutting or something in case they, they don't, you know, in case I sort of get away. Let's say they cut. But, yeah, yeah, anything that, in which you have a wound will initiate that clotting cascade if, if, if you're okay, if you have all the So would the wound in. be considered a protease? No, the wound is, is the, the, the uh, thing that will trigger it. The wound is the trigger, okay? We have all the clotting factors there. Once that trigger happens, basically that's going to activate the first proenzyme to make it active, and then subsequently it's going to keep, you know, the next one, the next one, the next one, like dominoes falling off. Protease is not the proenzyme, correct? Protease is not the proenzyme, right, because that's active. It's actually doing something. The last thing is, is I don't want you, of course, to memorize all these factors, etc., but I, I, I want you to know this, these last steps, in a way that I want you to be able to recognize two main ways to recognize whether something is a zymogen, and I won't give you any other terms besides this, is that we put a pro on front or else sort of this O-gen on back. So if you just look at the last two steps, or almost the last two steps before we actually clot, uh, you have prothrombin, it's converted, doesn't matter who does it, to thrombin. So this guy, is he a zymogen or is he active? And then thrombin, active. Okay? Now this guy's ready to go. It's going to take fibrinogen and convert it to fibrin. Fibrinogen is inactive zymogen, fibrin active. Okay? And we'll form our clot later. So right now, again, it's, it's kind of memorization, but I really want you to recognize that if you see prothrombin or fibrinogen, those are the inactive forms. Okay? And that's going to recognize it. I'm not going to give you some other pro or antigen or something like that because, you know, I mean, we're not doing that. I just want you to sort of emphasize that. Okay? So that's the enzymes. Really all from enzymes is to remember that, uh, you know, we're lowering activation energy, that you understand that, and then understanding again this idea of the zymogen. Yeah, the last thing on this and it will, it will kind of go to one thing we're going to do in, in a minute, that's actually really important, is that the folding of proteins, which are enzymes as well, again determine its function. And this is why, again, even, even not really remembering that one, when we talk about thermoregulation, and we're going to talk about pH regulation today, and uh, you know, other type of things, it's to keep things, you know, the proteins actually folded. Otherwise, you lose the shape, you denature it, and a lot of times you can't go back. Okay? If you cook an egg, the white albumin protein solidifies, it's not going back to liquid. And that's sort of, we don't want to make our proteins into, uh, into uh, egg whites that are harder. And so, what's, so that's why, again, that's a lot of the reason that so much is done to thermoregulate within that narrow range. And we're going to see pH, acid and base, which we're going to talk about uh, after we name these, is going to be also all the proteins work within a very narrow range. And if you start getting out of range, we need to correct that or bad news happens. And we're hundreds of thousands of proteins. There are enzymes and there are the transport proteins. They're actually doing most of the work in our body. Okay? And we're going to talk about this.
pH homeostasis. But I want to get the easier thing out of the way first. Because that's going to be the last hard thing. The easier thing is to name all these, believe it or not. Okay? And so I'm going to erase this. You need to know the names of making and breaking the, these things down, but there's a trick. Okay, and I, I want to sort of clean it up a bit. We understand coupled reactions, so I don't, I really don't want that there, just because I want us just to name these things. And we don't even need ATP now. So, the trick here to name things, and we're just going to name them all, will be uh, for anabolic action, reactions in which we're making things, you're going to see often the suffix will be genesis, which makes sense. We're making something. For catabolic, it's going to be lysis. So, let's name them. Now, for proteins, uh, we actually, you know, you can call it proteogenesis if you want, but a lot of times we will just call it protein synthesis. This is not going to be an essay, which I'm going to have you draw all this, but you need to know the term, so we're writing it. Because, you know, I don't want just pure, it's just not that interesting to me. So when we make proteins, it's protein synthesis. Okay, that's easy. But how about we break them down? What are we going to call it? Proteo or proteolysis. You just put lysis on it. Break down of proteins, pro, you know, proteolysis. Okay? Again, the build, we learned the building blocks of proteins were amino acids. When we're going to put them together to make proteins, protein synthesis. When we break them back down to amino acids, proteolysis. Okay. The, again, the lipids, the, you know, we, steroid hormones are lipids as well. We're not talking about their synthesis. The major storage of energy is in triglycerides, okay? And these are lipids. Lipids are going to be the key word here, and that's, we just are just going to apply these two terms. When we make the lipid, it's going to be genesis. lipogenesis. That's what you'll put. Making it or no, lipogenesis. So you're literally just putting lipo, you just remember the lipid. And guess what? We break it down, it's going to be called, let's put the lysis exactly, lipolysis. Okay? So far, so good? Lipogenesis, lipolysis. I'm going to talk about this guy a little bit in a second. We're going to name a little bit more. Okay? When we let's just get a little more room here. And actually, let's just do this one first. Okay? Now again, we're making glycogen or we're breaking down glycogen. So that's the word glycogen. All we have to do is use these terms. Genesis or lysis. So when we're making glycogen, we're gonna call it we're making glycogen, glycogenesis. Okay, all you're doing is basically ending it, you know, make sure it's genesis, glycogenesis. How come proteins isn't progenesis? You know, it just doesn't turn that much, you know. You know, you can, some, you might see somewhere proteogenesis or something like that, it just, it just doesn't use that much. And again, it's not an essay where, you know, you, you know, you have to put it in like that. It's going to be recognizing. Does everyone see? It's glycogenesis. We're making glycogen. When we're breaking down glycogen, what do you think we're going to call it? Glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis. Okay? Don't call it glycolysis. That's the little trick here. We're only looking at, you know, making glycogen, glycogenesis, or breaking down glycogen, which we're going to be, is going to be called then glycogenolysis. Okay? It's the glycogen here. 
okay? We're going to add glycolysis down here in a second, but that's going to be a key thing, and it's going to fit in where? It's going to fit in here. We're going to revisit this uh, because we're talking glucose and glycogen here, and that's going to be important. We're going to fit this in. <coughs> Those terms good. Glycogenesis, glycogenolysis. Break down glucose a little bit by a few steps into pyruvate. These won't be as important, but I'll write them. Glycolysis. Break it all the way down through all those steps, which most of you have learned at some point, using the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. Anybody remember all that? Basically extracting the rest of that. We're just going to call it you know, aerobic respiration because it's, you know, multi-step. And just two more terms we're going to add to this, and then we're going to go to, to, uh, to blood glucose. So, so overall, this is just naming these. And maybe it's a memorization thing, but using this trick, it should help you, you know, actually get it where it's not going to be as hard as some other things. Protein synthesis, proteolysis, lipogenesis, Lipolysis, uh, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, and then these are sort of less important, glycolysis. I mean, don't worry about these as much, but all of these are what we're really going to be doing, talking about. Two more, two, more, two more terms here, and then we'll relate it. Okay, so again, I'm skipping that part. <laughs> we're coming back. Again, just for, just for a second here, in case you haven't had this in a long time, uh, this is the idea, glycolysis or the first steps of breaking out glucose. It doesn't require oxygen. And then you go through all these steps of the Krebs cycle, also called citric acid, the electron transport chain, and we use the oxygen there at the end. That's why we need oxygen. But no details we need to know. But that's sort of, you know, that I'm summarizing is all of this. So luckily for this class, you don't need to know those details. Okay, I'm going to get... All that won't be important. The only thing from this, and look at this slide, oh, it's crazy, that I want one more term here. Okay, if you remember fatty acids, and you better remember fatty acids because you have to identify them, there are these long carbon chains, and that means tons of energy. When we're going to use that for energy, what we're going to do basically, let's just put it here, basically from the fatty acids, it's going to be something called beta oxidation. And that's basically, we're, all we're going to basically do, here's this long hydrocarbon chain. We're literally going to cut, cut the fat two carbons at a time, feed it into the cycle, okay, to get energy. So the details of that, not necessarily, not necessarily you know, you have to know, but when we're going to get energy from the fatty acids, you have to know the term beta oxidation, and it's breaking down this fat a couple carbons at a time to get the energy. Because we want to maximize the energy we're getting out of fat. That's where most of our energy is. Where does glycolysis come from? Because it doesn't match anything else. The, where does it come from? Well, I mean, like, because that's glycogen, and you're breaking down and building up. Over here, you're making... Oh, it, why we don't call it glucolysis? Yeah. Yeah, hey, I don't know. But so what... <laughs> Yeah, I know. And that's the only thing that it's called glycolysis, right? It's breaking down of glucose. glucose up to the level of pyruvate, right? Right, and that's just the process. It's not like anything in between, like the intermediaries. No, but there is there are like ten steps of it, right? If you, if you take you take it, you learn it. Here, we're just saying that's the first stage here of breaking it down. It just doesn't require oxygen, and, but again, for us right now, probably not that critical. Just sort of getting this overall. One more term, and then we do something fun. One more we have to know. Then we apply it to this, and then we control our pH. Gluconeogenesis. Okay, glucose is very important, and so we're going to see, it's going to be the liver we're going to see. Kidney kind of, you know, we put kidney everywhere. Kidney does everything. But the idea is this. We need glucose. What if we can make glucose from non-carbohydrates? Can we sort of, as we're breaking things down into amino acids and maybe getting some glycerol here, can we put those together to make glucose? And the liver says, yes, I can. And so that idea is going to be called, and again, you can kind of look it up there, that 
putting non-carbohydrates like amino acids and glycerol together and making glucose is called, I almost want a different color for it if I have it, gluconeogenesis. That's taking two non-carbohydrates -carbo and making glucose? Exactly. Okay. Again, you have it up here too. You're taking non-carbohydrates. You know, coming from, again, don't worry about lactate at all, amino acids and glycerol, those are the breakdowns. You're taking those and you're making glucose out of it because glucose is so important because, again, glucose is the main source of energy for the brain. The brain and it is on the test. I put it on there yesterday to make sure that's one of the questions, okay? And so everybody here should get that one. And, you know, we're going to add that to blood glucose. You really are going to start to see, yeah, it does seem to be pretty important, okay? So, uh... You know, so, you know, drink some glucose. Hope that has glucose in it. Uh, can you explain that oxidation more? Beta oxidation is you have fats. You remember the fatty acids have like 15, 18 carbons. So to maximize how we can extract the energy, we're simply going to take two, you know, we're going to break two carbons off at a time and then that feed that into the cycle that's going to make ATP. Okay. Again, you can see I'm skipping the details of it, but that's what it basically okay. is. So you need to know all these terms. Again, not an essay question. I'm not going to have draw out all metabolism. But if I talk about something, you know, you know, which we'll see even now, if I talk about uh, glycogenolysis, you're going to know it's the breakdown of glycogen and glucose. Okay, hopefully. And again, if you look at those extra questions, you see I have a couple on there. Again, you might have to remember they're catabolic or anabolic, but that's all easy now. But that's the terminology. Speaking of the extra questions in those bonds, um, I don't remember from chemistry, but when you're dealing with carbon and hydrogen, a lot of times those are covalent bonds because they're sharing, but are, are they both covalent and hydrogen bonds? No. No, those aren't called hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are like between molecules, and these won't even form hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are between something, like here we have oxygen, hydrogen. They don't have to even involve hydrogen. They're involving polar molecules attracting. This has a partial negative charge. This has a partial positive. So if you have another water molecule here, okay, it's going to be attracted. The oxygen, not a good picture. I need a dot, dot, dot. is attracted to the, the nearby water, right, with the hydrogen. And this hydrogen is attracted to the oxygen of the nearby. And we draw those again, dot, 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 because each one is relatively weak. But if you look at water, there's hundreds of these. That gives it sort of that strength to it. So the key word there is between molecules. Just having hydrogen, you know, those for a fatty acid, that's all covalent bonded. All of our, our basic macromolecules covalently bonded. Let's, let's sort of do this one more time, adding the details. This is everything we're going to need to know for this test about homeostatic blood glucose. So. And we've done a lot of this before. We're doing it one more time, and I want to make sure we have all the factoids we need. And so if blood glucose goes above the range, again, it might go to the level of having hyperglycemia. Now remember, you know, if, if you've just eaten, you know, candy bar, your blood, your, you know, we absorb the glucose and it's above that range, you know, you're not necessarily hyperglycemic, okay, there's a certain level, but this will kick in right away as soon as you're above there. And so we need something to detect it. And we need specifically the cell type as well. What is going to detect high blood sugar? And what cell type? Beta islet cells, exactly. So you've got to know that because some of the questions might involve that particular cell type of the pancreas. It's going to produce what? Insulin. Okay? Insulin, which is a hormone. What kind of hormone? Protein. It's going to have the properties of the protein. Where is it made? In, within a cell. Within the cell? Rough ER. That's incorporating that. Okay, the pancreas is releasing insulin into the blood. What kind of gland does that make it, or these cells? Are they endocrine or exocrine? Endocrine. endocrine. Ah, do you see sort of the complexity of this now? You know, you have to put these different things you're learning in one, okay? That's why, you know, a thousand note cards, I don't know if that will work. You've got to just be automatically thinking these things like you guys are. Insulin, 
All we say about insulin right now, we'll review it later, it's going to lower blood glucose by... And then, and I'll kind of show that too, and right now, just for this part here, uh, the idea is going to, you know, increase, we'll put an arrow up, glucose getting into the cell. But it's going to lower in the blood, right? Right, because it's taking out of the blood, putting it into the cells, mm -hmm. thereby lowering blood glucose. So, you see as we're doing that, we're coming back to homeostatic range. And once we do that, what kind of feedback? Negative. Negative feedback says, stop. Don't keep making more insulin, or we might go too far, right? We want, we've done what we needed to do, got us back within the range. Okay? I'll mention type 1 and type 2 in a second to go back to that. Let's finish this off and add a couple of these terms here. Okay? So, in fact, let me make this so I have enough room. You know, blood glucose drops, again, it might be you haven't eaten in an hour, it might be you haven't eaten in a day, it will just drop further. You know, if it drops too far, again, it's not uh, hyperglycemia, it's hypo. Again, I'm going to write the whole thing, hypoglycemia. The key is knowing, again, the cell type and the organ. So you have to know you have the alpha islet cells, of course it is the pancreas. And should we have one more G word? Okay, I'm going to put it up here. Glucagon. Again, same sort of idea as insulin. It is a protein. It's a protein hormone. And, uh, you know, made in the rough ER, all that stuff kind of applies here. Now, glucagon is going to help do what? Increase blood sugar. We're going to show you how down here. That fits this in. And again, but just to say, once we show you how it happens, once blood glucose levels are back to range, we're going to have, again, this whole idea of negative fever. Glucagon. Okay? Where, you know, when we're, t we're talking glucose and we're talking glycogen, uh, that's what we're really concentrating on now. And the idea is glycogen, the storage of glucose, is in what organ? What's the major place we store glycogen? The liver. And so glucagon says, okay, you know, we need glucose, right? The brain is starting, where is it? It's the liver. The glucagon is going to go, it's going to go to the liver. And now we're adding two terms, okay? We're going to show you, before we didn't quite mention how we raise blood glucose, but we have terms. We understand, we're going to understand basically what it's going to stimulate the liver to do. And what are the ways we're going to be able to do it? What, which process by name is this going to stimulate? Glycogenolysis, right? We've stored all that sugar and glycogen in the liver. It's time to break it down to glucose so it can go in the blood. So before we just set it, increases it, but what it's actually doing is going to the liver and stimulating that term that you sort of memorized. Glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis. Okay? Hormone related to what it's actually going to do. We need blood glucose. It's stored in the liver as glycogen. Let's go ahead and, you know, it's going to be the enzymes, etc. It's going to stimulate the liver to, to perform glycogenolysis. Break down the glucose, goes in the blood, kind of what we want to do. What was the other magical way? What was the other magical way that the liver might be involved to get glucose? And that is what they do. So, again, the glucagon goes to the liver. It stimulates the liver to do both those processes. Gluconeogenesis. Okay, to, again, to make glucose out of these other byproducts and glycogenolysis to go ahead and use that storage of energy that was in the liver, okay, as the form of glycogen. That's how we get the glucose that we need so that the brain is happy. Once, once we're back to normal, you know, we, we sort of go back to, to where we were. Did you have a question back there?
Yeah. The negative feedback, and again, you know, but this is real critical for life. When we come down to it, we'll do type 1, type 2. You know, chronic diabetes overall, you know, destroys life, but you could die if, if blood sugar drops too low. So this is a real critical process, and the more, you know, from, you know, not eating for an hour, or maybe fasting, or maybe starving, these things really kick in more. Later in the course, we'll, we'll even, we're going to expand upon this and talk about these things actually affect all metabolism when it comes down to it. Right now, it's a little taste of it. Glycogen is also stored in the skeletal muscles, and there is some effect, but again, just to answer your question without having to know it here, generally what, what's going to happen is we're going to basically allow, well, well it's, good, it's a little complicated, you know, it's going to stimulate, it's going to, it's going to stimulate the, the, um, the muscles to kind of use their glycogen, but also it will kind of be delivered uh, to, the, to the liver to do something, so it's a little complicated, but yeah, there is some in the skeletal muscle as well. That's what I'm talking about right now, and then, and then breathe deep for something really fun. Okay, type one, type two. Let's write it over here. Uh, I'll write you write that equation in a minute. Uh, I can write it over here because we're we can take a break and get rid of this board uh, so I can actually do something here. So type one and type two. This is more over here. What's a room here? So type 1, these are diabetes, you can write that. Type 1 diabetes is ba basically an autoimmune destruction of the, guess what cell type? Beta islet cells. So it's an autoimmune disease, sometimes you'll hear it as you know, childhood, Onset type one basically you did I did I skim right yeah you destroy the beta islet cells and if you destroy the beta islet cells what's going on with insulin it's not producing no insulin so are you, if you if your patient is this or you are this are you insulin dependent do you need insulin injections yes. yes the bigger problem as far as epidemic is type 2. So just to remind us, here's a cell, okay, here's glucose, here's insulin. We don't need to know the details of this, but it's going to help, a little bit's going to help us understand what type 2 is. You know, for instance, basically glucose, okay, wants to get into the cell so we can do all of this and get some energy out of it. That makes sense. Can glucose just pass through no, by diffusion? No, no. no, it's going to need some sort of protein to help it along, okay? Uh, but we don't want glucose to just do it anytime. We want to control it. So the key is insulin is going to bind to its protein on this, its receptor. Now, we won't go into the details of this, chapter 6, but the idea is it binds that. It's basically going to activate so that glucose can enter the cell. Right now, we just say glucose entry in the cell, and then da -da, energy. So not all cells, but a lot of cells, basically, insulin is needed to bind to its receptor that will then activate and, and allow glucose to come in. That's what insulin does. If you don't have insulin, you can't get glucose in. Type 2, you've got insulin. Okay, we haven't done this. What happens in type 2 is that the insulin receptors that are on the cell here we could say stop working properly to make it sort of simple. So even though your beta islet cells are throwing out insulin these receptors are no longer responsive, are less responsive, and it's progressive. And as that happens, that means, hey, you can't get glucose in. Even though you have insulin, it's, got to, it's a two-way you know, two street here. It has to bind to its receptor and activate this process. Type 2 diabetes, basically, which is an epidemic, it's not as, you know, there's genetic predisposition and everything. Uh, a lot of it is caused by obesity. 
uh, the idea is that's going to help to desensitize these or make them so they don't work. And so the idea of type 2 diabetes is exactly what I just wrote here. The insulin receptors stop working. So at least at, the, at, least at the early stages, you have insulin. So you are not insulin dependent. Okay? You don't want insulin injections. Eventually, you know, you keep making insulin, insulin, you know, your beta islet cells might give out. But the early stages of most type 2 diabetes, you, your beta islet cells are working, you're making insulin, you simply, your cells aren't responding to it. So then what happens? Then you have diabetes, <laughs> right? Well, <I'm> <laughs> then, uh, and then again, you know, what will happen is, as, they, as it stops working more and more, and you keep producing insulin to try to do it, your beta islet cells eventually give out too, and then you become insulin dependent if you don't treat it. Uh, Otherwise, if it, you know, if you treat it right away and then start losing weight, okay. I mean, there's other factors as well, but obesity is one of the major things. You can you can basically somewhat reverse the condition, okay. That's why you know if you you know if you again if you go back to where I'm from, like St. Louis, we're all fat smoking people with Arby's in our hand. Uh, maybe in the South is really bad too. The coast we're pretty good on weight. Obesity causes diabetes and cancer and heart disease, that's really sort of a problem. Not, not what you eat per se with these diets, but energy balance. Yeah. I think, I think you might have just answered my question. Um, it was to be like three bars, like three candy bars a day for 20 years, did the receptor stop working? But, but really, it's more of the fat. You know, and again, it's, it's still complicated as far as overall. You know, if you, if you have a lot of these things where you have these insulin spikes, you know, this like drinking Coke and, and sugar things, that also sort of puts this under pressure and makes it stop working and makes the cells less sensitive. But it's also really more just the idea of eating, you know, of eating those things or you end up getting a lot of empty calories and end up also becoming obese. Fat is like a huge gland. It puts out all of these hormones and, and different things that basically come in and desensitize these cells. That's why obesity is really bad. Don't be obese. Energy balance. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, for this. Sorry. I have a lot of questions, David. Um, I thought, just for, I don't know a lot about diabetes, but I thought it meant that you have low blood sugar. No, the high blood sugar. Right. So, okay, and then that's clearly why I was confused the whole time when you originally explained it. Yeah, that's, you know, you have high blood sugar because your cells, your cells are unable to take in the, the glucose. Right. So within and, the cell, it's and what, bad. what is happening when people, when you can die from diabetes? Is it just because you have no energy or because... No, it starts, there's a lot of complications, but having high sugar, part of it will be, we'll see that, you know, we learned it in, in lab that osmosis salt will attract water by osmosis. Guess what sugar does? The same thing. So you start really mess. It starts attracting water. That's why, actually, and we'll get to it later. You know, when you, what's one of the symptoms of uh, you know of diabetes? Thirst. 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 And because what? What's happening as far as urination? Okay. You know, as as your urine is farming, if it's got sugar in it, because we can't get rid of it all, it's so high. What's it going to attract? Sugar party. It attracts water. So that's going to cause you to lose water. That's going to make you thirsty. That's part of some of the symptoms of it. But, you know, it, it basically, well, we'll get to it, too. It starts just causing different changes in, you know, osmosis from these things and causing nerve damage. It's long-term. Okay. I need you to take it. We're going to talk about this. But we need a separate piece of paper. I need you to... Clear your mind, think about, meditate for two and a half minutes, okay? Because this is going to be big. So jump up and down, drink whatever you have.
Okay, guys, what we're going to talk about is, we, you know, we're going to, we have this idea of this overall idea within the chapter of this law of mass action, and we're going to talk about it. We're not going to do sort of that little, you know, equilibrium constant type of thing at all. We're going to use it to sort of an equation here that, that basically it's going to have an enzyme we're going to talk about, but overall... This is happening in about five different physiological systems we're going to cover, controlling pH, controlling the acidity or alkalinity of our blood and tissues and cells, etc. Okay? So, the first thing I want to do over here, which was sort of at the end of chapter two, maybe, pH, because I don't think I've talked about it then, I was going to wait here. You have this idea of, this is seven, of a pH scale. The pH, you don't have to know the specific formula right now, that it's the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. What you do have to know is it's measuring the acidity, it's measuring how much hydrogen ion, H plus. Okay? You know, and I have that in this equation. So hydrogen ion is related to the pH scale. And if you're seven, we consider pH of neutral, right? I mean, I think we sort of know that. The idea of this, if you're less than seven, you are acidic. And right now, for us, when we're doing pH homeostasis, if we blow our little range, you don't have to know the exact number, is like 7.35 to 7.45. You don't need to know that number. But what I want you to get is, it's pretty small. Now, if we do something which we'll talk about in which we lower the pH below it, it's going to be acidic, and that's acidosis. Okay, if you raise it above that, alkalosis. Okay, basic, okay, right, alkalosis for us, because we're going to apply it to the human body, not just, you know, different things that you have at home or anything like that. So, you know, acidosis, it has a pH range below normal, alkalosis, a pH range above normal. The only other thing I want to add to this, and then we're going to actually do something simple here, over here, and then complicate it, is that you've got to sort of realize how much hydrogen is related to things. Like, in this case, you know, the more you go down, the lower the pH number. Okay, let's just give an example. If we have pH 5 and pH 7, okay? Well, obviously, 5 is a lower number. I mean, it's more acidic. What I want you to know is which one of these two has more hydrogen. So, yeah, everyone's, because it's that negative thing. So, pH 5 has more hydrogen. How much more? Ten times ten, a hundredfold more, because it's a log scale. So how many divisions do you have to do it? But right now for this test, you just have to remember that the lower the pH number, the, the more acidic, the more hydrogen. That's the opposite, right? In fact, I'll even write that. You know, lower pH means more hydrogen. Okay. So. What we're going to find, 
and we're going to simplify it here, and then the complicated thing will happen, is pH homeostasis, okay, alkalosis, that will help this, and acidosis. We're going to have two systems, the respiratory system and our friend the kidney, respond to restore pH homeostasis under both conditions, okay, respiratory and kidney. Respiratory and kidney are going to respond. Now, to understand the respiratory response, which is the key to what will come over here, is you've got to relate CO2, which is what we breathe out. They're going to show you even more in a minute. There's a direct relationship between acidity, acid, and CO2. There's a direct relationship. And so right now, what I want you to, to, to get, even before we do the detail, when you, don't worry about oxygen on breathing now. Just worry about CO2. When you breathe out, you're breathing out acid. That's literally what you want to think about and have it in your brain. Breathing out is breathing out acid. Okay? Let's breathe out some acid. Breathing out CO2 is breathing out acid because it's, good, it's, good, it's going to be a relationship. I'll show you in a minute how. You've got to just sort of trust me. Okay? See, breathing out CO2 is acid. Okay? So, we can figure this out. If you have acidosis, and we're going we're gonna to show you sort of, you know, we're going to go to these terms in a minute and, and for this. But if you have acidosis, your respiratory system is going to respond. It's going to respond by doing one of two things. It's going to increase respiration or decrease. What do you think? It's going to get rid of the acid. It's going to increase respiration. Because when you respire, you are blowing out CO2, which means you're blowing out acid. Okay? If you've got too much acid, your body's going to react and increase your ability to get rid of it. Okay? You're getting rid of it. You're getting rid of the acid. Good news. Okay? We can even go up here then. Alkalosis means you don't have enough hydrogen. So what do you want to do? And by doing that, we're not going to breathe out CO2. What are we going to do? We're going to hold our breath. We're going to keep it in. And again, we're going to show you in a second how. That means we're going to increase our acid. So as long as you remember, and we're, you'll, you'll believe me, you'll remember more in a minute, but I want to get the, the, the brief thing here. As long as you remember that when you're respiring, you're getting rid of CO2, which is getting rid of acid. show you how in a minute, but that's, you've just got to remember that, okay? That don't worry about oxygen. You're expiring, you're respiring, you are blowing out CO2, you are blowing out acid. If you're too acidic, acidic, you're going to increase your respiration. If you're not acidic enough, holding CO2 will replace the acid, okay? So think of CO2 as being acid right now, related to it, but basically acid. You have too much, let's blow it out. You don't have enough, let's lower respiration to keep it in. The kidney, don't worry, we're just touching it. Come back in a couple months with your friends. But the kidney, all this blood and all these fluids are going through the kidney 60 times a day, 60 times a day. It's got a choice. It's going to actually have that in the kidney cells, we'll see. It has a choice. It's going to keep the acid in or throw it in the toilet. And that's all we have to do. It's going to, well, we're not going to write throw in the toilet. We're going to say excrete, okay, the hydrogen. <laughs> so, again, this should make just perfect sense here. If we're too acidic, what is the kidney going to do? Excrete the acid. The, the excess, right? And it's going to do that. It's not as fast as the respiratory system, but it's pretty good. Excrete the hydrogen. If, if, you, if you need hydrogen, your alkalosis, it's going to... And we'll just write conserve the hydrogen. I mean, you know, we're going to talk reabsorb and all this stuff. It's going to keep it in. No, that's not going in the toilet. Conserve the hydrogen. Conserve the acid. And... That, that's the overall, okay? The overall pH homeostasis, we're going to deal a lot with this in the course, including a little bit right now, is basically maintained by both the kidney and the respiratory system. The respiratory system being very fast, the kidney being, well, pretty good, 180 liters a day, and it's going to, you know, do it on a more chronic level, right? So you have a fast response and a slow response. They work together, okay? You lower, you have, you're too acidic, We'll breathe out the uh, acid. We'll breathe out and pee out, basically, the acid. Okay? Here, we'll hold our breath and keep the acid in, because we need it. 
I take a drink of honest tea. Okay, here is the key. That, and we're going we're gonna to play with this now and use the law of mass action. That when you talk about acidosis and alkalosis, there's really four sort of overall. Okay, the one respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, if the respiratory causes the, the problem, if the respiratory system is the cause, it's going to be termed this, and we're going to show you. If something else causes it, it's going to be not respiratory. If something else causes it, it's called metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. And we're going to give examples. Now, this law of mass action, that's how we're going to apply it. And again, you're not going to memorize this and you look at this. What the law of mass action is basically saying is, let's look at this as an example. If you have sort of an equation, okay, you know, a reaction that's, that's come to an equilibrium, okay, and this one, we've got carbon dioxide and water combining to produce hydrogen and, and this thing, which is bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, okay. Well, some of that now is going to combine and reproduce CO2 and H2O, and they, they've come to a balance, okay, and other reactions are like this way too. The law of mass action says, if you mess up that balance, if you change something on this side, it's going to react to come back to equilibrium. It's, something is going to happen on the other side, okay, until it comes back to equilibrium. And again, you can look at the, the little boxes, okay, you can do, you know, the, this guy if you like, but I don't look at it that way at all. So, you can't if it helps. So, here is the key. We're going we're gonna to go through this step by step and kind of see, see it will start to make sense. Okay, and we're going to do this linearly, step by step, and this is important because you're going to be doing this literally as part of the essay question, step by step. So, let's say, and right now, you know, we're going to put, let's put one and leave it blank. Or, let's not leave it blank. Let's say we, we're going to go to one of these. Let's say we hypoventilate. Okay, hypo is, is, is that increasing or decreasing ventilation? Decreasing. Okay, whenever you're messing with either hypo or hyperventilating, those are the two we're going to do, and you're trying to see what's going to happen, you're starting on this side because ventilation is, is, is uh, directly related to carbon dioxide, right? You're keeping it in, you're blowing it out. So, if you hypoventilate, I want you to look over here, and what is happening to CO2 levels if you hypoventilate? What's happening within the body? So that means you're going up. This, this was a nice equilibrium. Now what we did by hypoventilating is our CO2 levels you know, within the body went up. Now, number three is the law of mass action. Okay, And I'm going to put LMA, law of mass action. The, the, whenever you do something on this side or this side, the next thing to think about is it's going to shift this Okay, because we're out of balance. And what you have to sort of get is, if you add something here, like CO2, is that going to shift this so more of the reaction goes this way or the opposite way? How many people say, by adding CO2 to this side, we're going to shift in this direction? How many people say that direction? How many people are waiting to find out the answer? <laughs> okay, now check this out. There's, there's several ways to look at this. Here's two ways. You know, for me, the idea is this. If we add CO2 now, we had, we had the right amount, we have now what? Too much. How do we get rid of it? We add it with water and convert it to these products. Okay? If you have too much of this, you've got to basically balance it out by having it go that direction. And so the law of mass action, if you add one of these, these reactants here, it's going to shift it that way to try to get rid of that excess CO2. Now, the way some students, see, again, students have their different ways of coming up to help to, to remember it. This may help or may not. If you think about this sort of being in like a balloon, okay, like with air, you know, with a constriction here. If you add air to the side, which way is it going to flow? Well, you're, it's a balloon. You're, 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 you, know, you, put a, you put like a tube, a hole in this, and you put air in this, okay? Which way is the air going to flow now within this balloon? Is that, you, what? Well, it's already in. You put it in here, you know, what's going to happen to it? 
right. It's going to go to the right. If you don't like the arrow one, don't do it. You better understand a one way though. Everyone's, everyone's got to visualize differently. The idea is if you add something here to this side, it's going to cause by the law of mass action basically going the other direction. Okay? I don't want, when we're doing this, I don't want, according to La Chatteris principle, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Because some people came from chemistry and it sounds good and it's right, but it's not showing what I want. I want you to see the flow here. Because number four is, once you do this arrow, and you can actually summarize it with an arrow LMA, you've got to go the right direction, and we're going to do another one. The idea, once you do this, I want to know what happened over here. And we're not even going to, we're not even going to concentrate on bicarbonate. We're just concentrating on hydrogen ion. So if we're shifting, we hypoventilated, CO2 built up, long mass action says we're going this way, what happens to hydrogen levels? increases because we went that direction. Too much CO2, law of mass action says we're going to make more of both of these, but we care about hydrogen. If you have more hydrogen, what happens to the pH? And what do we call that? The respiratory system caused it, so we're going to call this condition respiratory acidosis. Only one more step here on this, okay? So, and the only one I'm going to put here, and then I'm going to go back and do it again and put it up here. Actually, you can put it up here already. So, hypoventilation, because it caused the problem. Hypoventilation caused the problem here. And so, you hypoventilated. That means CO2 built up. According to the law of mass action now, we shift this direction. Hydrogen builds up. pH is lower. If it's lower than normal, which, which right now we're saying it is, we have respiratory acidosis. Who's going to respond? Who's left? Kidney. Kidney says, okay, you caused a problem here. I'm going to try to correct it here. And so the kidney responds by... What's it going to do with that acid? Excreted. Excreted acid. Okay? We're going to do another one of these. We're going to do a metabolic one. Again, you know, if, if hypoventilation, when you play with it, cause respiratory acidosis, guess what's going to cause respiratory alkalosis? And I'm not going to do that one for us because I'm going to do one of these. Well, I might do it later, but I want to get it for this class period. So again, let's just follow this and then we'll, we'll do, we're going to do, uh, we're going to vomit. Okay. <laughs> Excess, bad, vomiting. So what we did here, and this and again, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be questions of multiple choice, but there's going to be an essay question in which I'm going to give you one of these, and you've got to, and I'll, and I'll have to find it sort of in the question. I'll give you the equation, by the way. You're going to have to be able to go through these steps. You can use these, uh, you know, abbreviations, LMA and arrows up and down. In fact, I really don't want a paragraph. I sort of want it systematic, something like this, because I have a hundred of these, and I want you, I want to make sure. And again, you know, if you just get the right answer, if I just ask, what is this condition by hypoventilating? What happened to the pH? You get those parts right? Yeah, you'll get parts that are right. If you don't show me, because I'm going to say, use the law of mass action, and I don't want some statement of La Chatier's principle. I just don't, because I want you to see sort of the direction of it. Okay. All you have to do is LMA arrow that way or that way. Just get it right. Yeah. Not for this test. Okay. Because uh, it is true, but I want the I want to know that you actually see and is it's, you know I mean that's always going to be the case. You know again that's part of the law of mass action balance if you look at it. Whatever you do to one side, if you increase this, you increase this. If you decrease, you decrease, and you can know that. Okay, that helps you out. But I do want just for this essay question some some part of actually showing me that you understand the shift of reaction. Just for this, okay. So let's do another one. Again, we're going to vomit. Let's, let's, uh, we have the pH scale. Again, there's only four of them. And I've already put sort of the answer here because I want to make sure we have it. If you vomit, okay, two, what is in your stomach? Acid. Like a ton of acid. 
We have 100,000 fold concentrated acid in our stomach to do its job. So if you're vomiting, you're losing acid. Whenever we're doing metabolic, let's get rid of these arrows. Whenever we're doing metabolic, we're starting over here. Whenever we're doing respiratory, if it starts out, we're starting over here. So we're starting over here, and we just said we've lost hydrogen. Okay? We've lost hydrogen. If you, lost, if you lose hydrogen, what happens to the pH? pH goes up. Okay? And again, I don't care if it's one, two, three, as long as it's sort of linear here. What, what do you call that? If your pH goes up too high, what do we have? What kind of alkalosis? Metabolic, because it caused it. We have, by vomiting, we have created a condition of metabolic alkalosis. Okay? So, we've lost hydrogen. Okay? Now, the next one is the law of mass action. By losing hydrogen, we're putting a hole in the side of the balloon, you can forget that. <laughs> by losing hydrogen, by losing hydrogen, we're either going to shift this way or that way. How many people say by losing hydrogen, we're going to shift to the right ear? How do you say to the left? Mm. We've, we've lost hydrogen. Don't we need to replace it? Oh, so you keep the it's, uh, CO2 in. The C, uh, well, hang on a second. But, but overall, within this reaction, the CO2 is going to combine with water, go this way to replace that hydrogen. Right? If these, go, if these combine and go that way, you're replacing these products. And again, the balloon method was, if you have this, you put a hole in this balloon, we've, so the hydrogen goes out, which way will the air flow? Toward the hole. Just ignore that. Okay, but it does help on some people. If you lose a product here, we've got to replace it. We do that by now shifting... So that more of these reactants here will, will combine to produce hydrogen and bicarbonate to replace what we lost. Okay? So and there's only four things we can do. We can add something here or lose something here. We can add something here or lose something here. And you have to start to get it. It was until we vomited. No, 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 no. Let's just follow this by the way I'm doing this, okay? You know, you've lost, you know, I mean, you know, when it comes down to it, because we haven't finished this up yet, we've lost hydrogen. You agree with that? We've got to replace it. Immediately, we've changed this reaction. The reaction now is going to shift this way, so the law of mass action will put it this way, which will do what to CO2 levels? And you know it from the other way, right? Decrease. Okay? You've lost hydrogen, okay, by vomiting. Cause the problem, metabolic alkalosis. The law of mass action says we've got to shift this way so that now we've decreased the amount of carbon dioxide. But we're not done yet. So we put, again, they go together like that. When something metabolic causes it, who's going to respond? The respiratory. Well, the kidney respond too. But the idea is for this, when something metabolic causes it, the respiratory is going to respond. And if we now don't have enough CO2, we're either going to increase respiration or decrease it. Decrease. Hold your breath. And that will correct the problem. By replacing that CO2. Decrease respiration. And that will be the response. And that response will be almost immediate. Okay, the kidney takes a little longer, but as soon as something like this happens, as soon as you're vomiting, okay, basically, and of course it has to be enough, you know, you become an alkalosis, you lower CO2, your ventilation decreases. So an answer question would be like, uh, you went out for a night drink and then you vomited, what happens? And then we have to No, it's going to be a little more specific than that. It's going to be, it's going to be, I'll put this equation up, I'm going to say vomiting, you know, you know, will happen, and, ba and basically using the law of mass action, explain, you know, what will happen to the pH, what we call the condition, how the respiratory system will respond. Okay. And literally, if you, if you just put that you're, and got it right, you've answered my question. You don't need sentences at all. You can sort of use it. But again, I, you know, and again, you might just get parts of it right, but when you start to do it this way, you're going to see the logic of it and how things are flowing, how when something metabolically happens, it's affecting CO2 levels and the respiratory system responds, or if something respiratory happens, it's affecting something here and the kidney's going to respond to do it. And so the only four conditions, again, you can do these other two on your own, if this sort of makes sense to repeat this, 
The only ones that, well, we actually, there's only one left. So hypo or hyperventilating, and you can do hyperventilation. I can do it later for, for, you know, with you as well. It's the same order. For metabolic acidosis, a lot of things cause alcohol, these metabolic ones. The only one I'll put will be sort of this, you know, in, intense exercise. You know, if you sort of go beyond your limit, your muscles start producing what? <laughs> Lactic acid. Lactate's good, kinesiologists, I know. But what's going to spill in your blood? Acid. Okay? And that's how you can get metabolic acidosis. So you're going to have metabolic acidosis, okay, and you're going to do the same thing. The respiratory system now, of course, will increase respiration to blow it out at the end. So the real key here, because we're basically done, uh, except for two slides I want to show on this. We're basically done with the material on the test. But, of course, you want to be working on this now. The, uh, now what was I actually saying? Something. The, the, yeah, the key, the key with this is, what, what, what students get confused over sometimes is, you know, they'll see respira you know, respiratory here, and they'll think, oh, it's respiratory acidosis, acidosis, and that's wrong. If the respiratory system causes it, it's at the top. It's respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. If something else causes it, it's metabolic, but you're going to see on the bottom here, sort of last step, the respiratory system responds to it. And so this is not respiratory acidosis, alkalosis. It's metabolic respiratory response. So for respiratory alkalosis, just the opposite? It would just be the opposite. You know, you you know, and again, you can, I don't want to go through the steps right now. You work it the exact way. You've lost CO2, da da da, you know that type of thing. Okay. So last last, there's three slides I want to show. This slide, because throughout the course, I'm going to be talking agonist antagonist, and even if I haven't covered a particular drug, you should understand what it does. And so you have this idea that you know hormones or factors will bind and activate receptor. We'll get a response. Okay? It's always specific. Okay? But, and again, we might, you know, let's look at the heart. That's a good heart. We're going to see later, and right now I just want to give it as an example, that there are receptors called beta-1 receptors on the heart that control heart rate. That if you stimulate beta-1, okay, if, if it's ligand, it's, it's hor um, it will be a neurotransmitter hormone, binds to it, to beta-1 receptors, it increases heart rate. So in this case, it's increasing heart rate. If you give a beta agonist, it means it looks just like this, it will do the same thing. And that's what you want to remember. An agonist will do the same thing. If you give someone a beta-1 agonist, it's going to increase heart rate. And increased blood pressure will deal with all that. It does the same thing. It's a drug that will do the same thing. It mimics the, you know, what the primary thing is doing. If you give an antagonist or a blocker, it reverses it. So, if you give a beta blocker, what's it do to heart rate? The Bo blocker will decrease heart rate, decrease blood pressure. That's when you give beta blockers, right, to decrease things. So, even if I'm talking about, you know, in, like a, in that section, let's say we didn't talk about beta blockers much, but we, we talked about beta-1 cells. If I give, if I say a beta antagonist, which I, you're going to know what happens, because you know what normally happens with beta, it increases heart rate, and antagonist will reverse. If I say agonist, you're like, it does the same thing. And so throughout the course, I'm going to, you know, no matter if I specifically talk about for something, an agonist or antagonist, if I put it on the test, that's how to get it. An agonist will do the same thing as what you just learned it does, an antagonist will do sort of the opposite, or block it. Negative feedback, we just talked about. I just want to show two slides. Another way of showing it, and this is where also, if you think about the extra question I put on, it's like I'm talking about thyroid hormones, and you're like, we didn't talk about thyroid hormones. But I give a system that uses, uh, that I say is homeostatic. Another way to visualize it besides this way is something like this between negative and positive feedback. You sort of have this idea that you're basically going through things, and then once this happens, whether it's the final reaction or product or what you make, it's going to come back and stop more of this from happening. So we come back to normal. This is another way to look at a negative feedback. You know, stimulus, response, and then once we come back to normal, it will slow it down. So, last two slides uh, for the, for, that I want to go with is the idea of a positive feedback loop in the example. A positive feedback loop, the opposite. 
Okay? You basically have something where you respond, but instead of coming back, it means more and more and more. Not homeostatic. Positive feedback loops are not homeostatic. I just talked about blood clotting. Okay, we don't want a little clotting. We want it to happen real fast. The other example, which will be the second to last slide of the course, by the way, is birthing. Okay. So if you look at if you look at birthing, okay, I'm, I'm from like St. Louis. This is birthing. Okay. <laughs> the idea of this is going to be, you know, you have the cervical stretch. You're not going to have to draw a baby and all this stuff. But it's going to stimulate the release of a hormone called oxytocin, which is flying around, causing uterine contractions. Okay. Now, we're saying, that's enough, let's just stay there. How many people want to do that? <laughs> okay, first of all, men would never do any of this. But women are like, no, that's probably not a good idea either. We want to get this out. So the contractions are going to cause more oxytocin release, which is going to cause what? More contractions, which are going to cause what? More oxytocin. This is a positive feedback loop, not homeostatic. It's going to take an external event to stop it. Pop. Baby out. Okay? I don't know what I'm talking about, obviously. Okay? So, uh, but you get the idea. So, and again, really, again, this will be the second, we'll end the course on positive feedback loops, all involving, you know, female reproduction, basically. The last slide of the course is breastfeeding. I hate that because it's like weird, but it is. <laughs> Okay, we could put this, and this is what we skipped. Oxytocin, that's just one thing, and we'll just put it here. I, actually, I won't even be on the top, but it's on your extra questions, but it's chapter six. Oxytocin is actually produced by the hypothalamus, okay, which is a nerve, but travels through the blood like a hormone. So oxytocin, although we didn't do it, and don't worry about it now, is actually called a neural hormone, if you have those extra questions. It's just that it's in chapter six, you know, this chapter we didn't cover it, and you're not going to have to know for the test, okay, because we didn't cover the chapter. But negative positive feedback loops are sort of overall. So that's, you know, you have to know agonist, antagonist, uh, you know, what they do, and just understand negative, you know, ne negative feedback loops are homeostatic. Positive feedback loops are not homeostatic. They want something to go and go and go until something else stops it. Okay. That is the material on the test. Again, okay. what you want to do is work on this. Uh, and again, I'm here. It's 10 o'clock. You can go. Obviously, I, I need a break to, to sort of do my, my, my breath, too. So, uh, you know, especially as we start going on, if, you, if you've got the extra questions and you've done some of them, we can look at it. Uh, if not, I would spend some time now to do it, okay, but it's up to you. Uh, the extra questions have some complexity to them. You want to understand sort of the critical thinking you might see or the complexity of the multiple choice. Make sure you get that. So you want to try to ask me that again. Timing is sort of now. Uh, I'll probably, just because we didn't have as much time, I'll post the answers. But the answers don't help you unless you really get it. So hopefully, how many people actually have extra questions with them or looked at them? That's, that's a good thing, okay? So again, I have the answers and I'll help you. I'll also help you if you want to go over this or anything else. Uh, I'll help you review. Tonicity, osmolarity, you want to review that? Yes, ma'am. No, that's crazy. No. That's, that's what you're supposed to do to, to get, you know, and again, you don't have to write those out. Those aren't the test questions at all, okay? But that's basically going through the handouts to make sure you know the basic material. If you have a question on, on one of the answers, you're not sure if you, if you, if you got the right answer, uh, you can ask me and I'll get, guide you. Say that again? That's, that's ridiculous. Okay. Um, when are you going to start the review? Like, how long is it going to it, it, Just a few minutes. Just let me catch my breath. Five, ten minutes. And again, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go up and sharpen the beginning of reviewing. We're done. What? I know. Okay. Yeah. So you know, five or ten minutes. People start turning out and coming back. <laughs>